you know, very often it was continually conversation of like, mommy, I want attention. And it was how often she was saying it. It was realizing, you know, I can't give this to her. And, um, you know, is, is that part realization? The other part that was like, I, I can barely function and take care of myself, mm-hmm. you know, and this, you know, to not be a neglecting mother, I knew mm-hmm. she deserved more. Thank you very much for joining us for this episode of, uh, you know, uh, Get Out of Your Comfort Zone. And uh, today we have uh, a very dear friend, uh, Lumalea, um, who is joining us from the West Coast. And uh, without further ado, I'd love to turn it over to you, Lumalea. Can you begin by telling us a little about you know, the Lumalia today and how you aim to support people through your current endeavors, your business, and we'll kind of like, you know, start there and, 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 and backtrack. Yeah. So I actually my, um, started a new business this past year called Luminosity, and it's really a program um, to help people find their inner spark again. So I call myself a body pyrotist pyrotechnician and it's a little bit different than a coach um a lot of coaches nowadays give you information and i come alongside people and help their body find the internal wisdom um to help them tap into joy on a regular basis and creativity and um just all the amazing goodness that our body holds for us and Um, I'm there to support you through the whole process. So I'm also a yoga teacher and have a background in that. And a big tool I use in my programs is the kindred meditation. Um, I also have a background in a photography business. And so I use a lot of my background with that and really helping people um, tap in and regulate their emotions. That's something that no one really knows that a photographer does. And Mm-hmm. Um, is, is regulate your, help you regulate your emotions. And I'm not a therapist whatsoever. I have a lot of history with self growth and healing through a lot of personal trauma. And I bring all of my own experiences into my program. So I have, yeah. Yeah, so I have like one-on-one offerings where I work with people for three months or I have a membership where people get to dive in just to heal their body using yoga and meditation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Amazing. And you know, it's funny. Uh, well, it's not funny because I believe this is though we might not all be licensed therapists. I, I believe we all have a little therapist within us um, that we serve to, you know, help others with. Um, and sometimes we help ourselves with it, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's easier to help others than to help ourselves. <laughs> yes. <laughs> At least in my experience. I think that's pretty universal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Lumalia. You know, one of the things that I picked up on is that you're a person with who's multi-talented, um, so many skills to offer um, to basically, uh, you know, help um, those who come into your life. And so with that, I'd love to sort of uh, jump, you know, into what spurred uh, you know, your, 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 your healing journey. Could you share a little bit of background on the health issues that you grappled with? Yeah. Um, so let's see, in 2013, I started to get, um, pretty sick and started to have like symptoms of like dizziness. Um, and then I got pregnant with my daughter and, uh, after her birth was pretty traumatic and um, started to get really sick uh, within two years um, and then got diagnosed with some autoimmune diseases. Um, and through that whole journey was um, a dis- pretty much a destruction of my whole current life. At the time, there was a point um, where 
I was so sick. I had to be wheelchair bound for a, um, a whole month because every time I stood up, I would pass out. And, wow. um, you know, I spent a good six months in doctor's offices trying to get diagnoses. And it was really like a two year long process to get my diagnoses. And, um, and, you know, at my worst, I had like full body rashes and that is the one that I never wish on anyone else because that, yeah, it's, it's hard to describe some, when your body goes through something like that, how to just cope in life and, um, feel like you even want to be alive anymore. Um, so there's been, there's been a lot of like nuances throughout the whole process. And then the biggest thing that did happen when I first got sick was uh, an accumulation of events is uh, my daughter and I had to stop um, nursing at the time. She was very little. She was still very little. Um, I got in a car accident. I had to have emergency surgery and, um, and then I had lost both use of both my wrists to the point that like my doctor told me I can't pick my own daughter up anymore because it wow. was, because they didn't know what was going on. Um, and with that, at the time I was running a successful mountain wedding photography business out in Colorado and I had to close my business because I couldn't work anymore. Um, so it was a very, it was a very tragic year to like, I couldn't even button my own pants. My, uh, joint issues were so horrible that um, that that was a thing. I couldn't hold a mug or my daughter, um, and and this, that was a very challenging year. And you and I was in my mid twenties then to wow have your your body just degenerate that much. Yeah, I mean, so powerful at such a young age. You know, at the height. Um, you know. To, to be able to, to go through that. Can you share uh, a bit more about sort of the darkness that you grappled with? And was there, you know, did you struggle with despair? And, and just sort of paint us a picture of, you know, uh, what your internal state was like as you were going through all of it. Yeah, definitely. I, and I felt like I've always been a very like glass is half full kind of person. I've always been a very joyful, jovial person. It's just my mm -hmm. natural proclivity. And um, when I got sick, it, you know, mental health is a huge thing that plays in with a lot of people with chronic illnesses because your whole world gets shut down and you get very isolated. Um, you know, I used to be a big rock climber and snowboarder. And so all of my, and a dancer and, all of my mm. loves, um, all the things that really brought me joy where I got to really use my body and, and, you know, get all those beautiful hormones got shut down. And, mm. and so, yeah, I had a lot of depression and anxiety throughout the whole process. You know, I think at my worst was the full body rashes. And that one was, that's, that's where I, you know, really struggled with suicide, suicidal thoughts and was, Thankfully, had a very amazing doctor supporting me uh, mm. uh, throughout the whole process, Dr. Sherry Green, and she she was really there helping me kind of regulate all of that. Um, and I was in and out of therapists, and mm. you know had a few amazing therapists come into my life at the time and um, support me. Uh, and finding a therapist who was also sick, which is really hard to do because a lot of people who are sick can't work, but um, finding a therapist who was also sick really changed a lot of things because she could really understand what I was going through. Um, so yeah, the depression got really bad uh, at the height of when I had the full body rashes. That was like it felt it felt like your skin was on fire and then you're itchy at the same time, mm. and nothing nothing relieved it. Um, and so that and that was that was the worst of it all. <laughs> Yeah. You know, before we move any forward, I just want to take a moment to, um, to sort of thank you for being so open about sharing, you know, the, the depth of the darkness and the despair that you felt. I believe that, you know, throughout our lives, we all go through our own versions of it. And 
hearing it from someone else, you know, even if we haven't gone through that yet, it, it serves as a, hey, I'm not alone. So, so thank you for being so honest about, you know, what a tough mental state situation you were in, um, you know, going through that. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about um, the timeline, right? Um, how things started in 2013 and, and really got exacerbated uh, with the birth of your daughter and, and rapidly sort of, um, uh, you know, escalated from there. You know, given that we are uh, talking about getting out of your comfort zone, what would you say, you know, uh, was the first way in which as you were dealing with this, that you sort of found yourself the opportunity to do that and push yourself to get out of your comfort zone? Yeah. Talk to us about the struggle of that. Yeah, I would say the first thing getting out of my comfort zone was actually getting a diagnosis. You know, it's like you, I feel like a lot of people do this, right? It's like you tolerate a lot of uncomfortability before, most people tolerate a lot of uncomfortability before they go to a doctor. They're like, oh, I have all these things wrong. Um, And there's my sister, like, I've never been one to, you know, advocate for like, oh, go to the doctor, go to the doctor. Um, Mm -hmm. Just... I've just not been a fan of the doctor ever. <laughs> you know, I don't know very many people who are unless you work in the medical field. Um, and as my sister who does work in the medical field, she was like, <laughs> promise me you're going to go figure out what's wrong. And so for six months, I did go do that. I did, I did push past the like, ah, this, you know, I'm just going to figure it out. I'll just figure it out. I'll, you know, find someone who knows, who thinks they might be able to heal me and <laughs> do whatever they tell me. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I did spend six months going to different physicians and thankfully was, you know, in Denver at the time and was with some of the most wonderful physicians. And my sister had contacts, which really helped to know who to go see, mm-hmm. um, seeing a rheumatologist, seeing um, a heart special, a cardiologist uh, for what was happening with me. And you know, if it hadn't been kind of for that information and and knowing the best doctors already through my sister's knowledge, uh, you know, my diagnoses of what I had takes most people eight years to get a diagnosis for it because a lot of people, a lot of physicians will say that it's just depression or it's just anxiety. Um, And there's not a lot of like cursors or markers to say like we can give you this diagnosis and there's like one test they can do, which they don't push very much um and thankfully my cardiologist did that the first time it was just like let's test for this and that was positive Mm -hmm. so that that helped get me a diagnosis more quickly but yeah that was it was challenging my daughter was two at the time and um she was home with me full time and I was very sick and she became we became a a full-time patient uh, mm. We were in doctor's offices three, four times a week. And mm. every time we'd go in, all the nurses would just praise her because they'd be like, she's so well behaved. I'm like, we've been doing this all week long for months. <laughs> this is like a normal <laughs> life for her now. And I'd just set her up with the, you know, my phone and turn Cinderella or Jungle Book on, <laughs> you know, just like whatever I had downloaded at the time. And, um, you know, this is before like Netflix and all those allowed you to download videos for, mm-hmm. you know, going out and about, but, you know, it was, it was just became our life. And that was so challenging to, you know, have some freedom and then go to like, you have to get all these appointments and all these therapies and, um, you know, it was helpful in the end, but at, at the end of it, I, you know, got to a point where I had a few diagnoses And I was going to more specialists and more specialists Mm -hmm. and all of my diagnoses, they were like, we don't know how to treat you. We don't know Mm. how to really help you. There's no drugs to help you manage any of your symptoms. Um, Mm. There are other drugs that have helped other people manage your symptoms, but they come with high risks like blindness Mm. and blood clots. (laughs) And I, you know, so it was a point where I got with Western medicine where they were like, I, we can't help you we can help you manage your symptoms with these other drugs that have helped other people, but aren't made for what you have. And Mm -hmm. uh, so it got to a point where I was like, okay, I'm I'm done going down the 
just getting diagnosed this route because that was where mm. that was the end of where Western medicine was able to help me personally. Yeah. And, you know, I, uh, I find myself closing my eyes as you were sort of um, talking about this and just like putting myself in your shoes. And I can only imagine for myself, you know, sort of having to go into the doctor's offices you know, X times a week for testing and, 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 you know, sort of going through the barrage of, of, of different doctors and, and just being in this state of not knowing what's going on. Cause you know, when it comes to healthcare, for the most part, we live in a society that's very like black and white. This is what's wrong with you. Here's how we can fix it. Mm -hmm. Right. And just because of that unknowingness and like you being a mother, the, the, the fear and, and, and like, everything that you must have grappled with. So thank you so much for, for, for sharing that kind of detail to help us understand, you know, um, just how um, steeped in the unknown um, and like, you know, not knowing what, what's, what the future looks like, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I know that we didn't talk about this as much in our last conversation, but I had the good fortune of, of meeting your daughter and, and interacting mm -hmm. with her. And, you know, she's an amazing, amazing uh, human being. Um, and, you know, in preparation for, for today's uh, episode, one of the things that, that really sort of stuck out to me is I got the sense, and, you know, please, you know, sort of uh, feel free to let me know if you, if you don't think this way, but, like, in the state that you were, having the courage to ask for help with your daughter in days where when you woke up and you just couldn't do it, that takes a lot of courage. And, 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 you know, I would argue, you know, if I was in your shoes, that that would definitely put me out of my comfort zone. So mm -hmm. can you speak a little bit to that, you know, and, and, and some of the challenges and how you overcame them and, and, and the kindness of, you know, friends and family that surrounded you? Yeah. You know, um, ever since my daughter was young, we've always been talking about emotions and expressing them and um, helping her have a big emotional awareness early on in life was, you know, the best thing I could do for her. And so very often she would just start to unravel. And, you know, because when she was growing up at first, I was working from home. And so I had to manage her and work and run a business at the same time. And so very often I would ask her, you know, when she's not feeling very good to say, mommy, I want attention. <laughs> and mm. so she would come to me very often, you know, she'd play for a while and then say, I want attention. And, you know, that just escalated as I got sick and I couldn't pay attention to her as much because mm. I was just trying to, you know, do basic things in life, just get out of bed, just you know, go get myself some food, get her some food. Um, and, you know, there was a point where she, when she was little, we had to move her into a bigger bed um, out of her crib so that way she could get out of bed and come, come in and hang out with me and, like, have breakfast ready for her in the morning already and her come snuggle in bed with me. And, you know, very often it was continually conversation of, like, Mommy, I want attention. And it was how often she was saying it. It was realizing you know, I can't give this to her. And, um, you know, is, is that part realization? The other part that was like, I, I can barely function and take care of myself, mm -hmm. you know, and this, you know, to not be a neglecting mother, I knew mm -hmm. she deserved more. And at the time we were in a beautiful community of people and friends and had some other friends that just stayed at home on a regular basis with their kids and so it was this group of people that I would reach out to pretty regularly and just ask if anyone could watch her for a couple of hours just so she could get some socialization, she could get some interaction, she could get some other adult attention in a way that I was able to show up and provide for her. Mm. Wow. Thank you so much for being so honest and raw, you know, about this. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, I really appreciate it. And I'm sure um, the audience does too. Yeah. So let's, let's take a step forward. Um, let's, let's spend a little bit of time talking about 
the turning point for you, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about the turning point in your healing journey when you start to see the first rays of light, you know, through the darkness that you grappled with, you know. And what did that look like? Um, paint us a picture. Yeah, I, you know, I feel like some of the first things is actually joining a grief group with one of the therapists mm. I had started to work with. And, um, you know, in that, there was two other gals that were sick. And mm. in that, it just, like, didn't feel so alone in that moment. Um, but at the time, connected with one gal and discovered she actually had the same illness as I did. And um, she supported me in doing some alternative medicine at the time. And, and in that same year I had closed my business and I had another friend invite me to a yoga class. And I really, um, you know, I had start to manage a little bit of what I was experiencing now. And I knew what was wrong. I knew how to like watch for my symptoms and figure out what was going on. And this was before, like I had my full body rashes and, um, this is more of like when I, you know, just had to be mindful of s some major symptoms, but otherwise, you know, could, could mm -hmm. be okay doing a few things. And so I had a friend invite me to her yoga class and I, um, I hated yoga <laughs> growing up. I really hated it. I was a dancer. I was like, where's the loud music? When are we going to start moving more <laughs> quickly? This is so slow and still. And she invited me to her class and it was a very spiritual experience. And I was like, oh, mm. this is not the yoga I like had experience with. And, mm. uh, you know, it was a very emotional tapping in moment and really listened to the wisdom of the body and her class just kind of shifted everything for me. So I started going to regular yoga classes, which was like my 16 year old self would have just dropped my jaw on the floor. If I would have told you I went to yoga, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it became the most accessible body movement I could have. Um, because there's a lot of yoga where you can really adapt it to um, being on the floor most of the time, which is what I did a lot of, or in a chair and really support your body in a way that, um, you know, if it is struggling a lot that it can, it can be there. Um, and so it was kind of like with that exposure, um, and having the support that then I felt a really deep passion to actually go do yoga teacher training. And it was mm. completely absurd to do that while I was so sick. I could, you know, I couldn't stand up for very long at the time, maybe, you know, 30 minutes before I had to go lay down and, um, you know, we were struggling financially with all the medical bills, you know, from trying, spending six months in doctor's offices and, um, I wasn't working anymore and, mm. and to then say, okay, here's a couple thousand dollars to go do yoga training. And, um, the training I did, they recommended like, you know, getting, uh, fundraising for a couple of months and getting supported and. So I was halfway supported and the rest, we just, you know, scraped by and made, figured out how to do it. Uh, but I did my yoga teacher training and that was a huge turning point for me to feel hope again and feel like, you know, there's something I can still do. There's still something mm -hmm. I can connect with other people on because when you're sick, mm -hmm. you're just so isolated. A lot of friends don't understand what you're going through. And unless mm. they're willing to come over and just sit on a couch with you and talk, most mm. don't understand. And, you know, you're, I was in a very depressed state. And so I was like, I was not the most enjoyable person to talk to. Mm. It's just like, I was very uncomfortable all the time and didn't have a lot to connect with other people in my life about. And, and that's really hard for other people to know how to be with someone who's sick. Yeah. And so you ends up, you know, you find out who your real friends are. And I found out I didn't have very many <laughs> um, real friends. And, you know, so to, to find a, a way back into society by becoming a yoga teacher was really profound and beautiful. And I um, was able to do my teacher training. I was able to connect with beautiful people across uh, the United States where I'm located and, and through the training that was online at the time, mostly. And then, oh. um, uh, 
and it just really shifted into seeing like I still have something to offer this world instead of feeling like hopeless. Like I got to close my business and <laughs> what do you do now with your life? Yeah. yeah. And you know, it must not have been easy to ask for help, you know, especially financial help mm -hmm. to help subsidize support your, your teacher training. Um, could you tell us, and so, you know, again, another instance where you sort of pushed yourself out of your comfort zone based on, you know, what you felt um, to, to ask for that help. Could you talk to us um, a little bit about, you know, that and the struggle and how you persevered to, to do that? Because asking for help, you know, <laughs> it's a lot harder. <laughs> I know I struggle with it, you know. I have a lot to learn from, from you and others in that regard. Yeah, I feel like a little bit of my, you know, being so sick and asking for help already had kind of prepared me a little bit to then go ask for, you know, a large mm. financial amount from other people. Um, yeah, you know, that is is super uncomfortable. Of just like, yeah, will you support me to go do something that's for me? <laughs> you know, and you know, but really tried to help myself see that this just wasn't for me. Like what I wanted to do was to then go serve other people and help them connect back with their body in a way yeah. that, you know, this was teaching me how to do, um, and offer it into the communities that people were in. And, and so I made it in such a way that like, it felt more like I, people were investing in a community mm -hmm. effort versus just investing in me alone. And, um, so I feel like that helped me kind of navigate through the waters of like, this is really awkward and uncomfortable to mm -hmm. know this is actually supportive and beneficial, not just for us, but in, you know, in all the spaces that I'm going to be able to go be a part of after this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, and, you know, I know that we talked about this a little bit before, um, but I'd love uh, what you had told about, you know, sort of, your, for lack of a better term, brand of yoga being one that's much more restorative yoga as opposed to a lot of this um, handstand yoga that we see these days. And, and somebody, as, as somebody who is, who is Indian, um, you know, uh, and obviously this is about me, everybody. <laughs> I know that our guest, but we're going to go off on a tangent and make, make this next segment about me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel like, you know, as somebody who's Indian, you know, uh, li like a lot of things, you know, yoga has been co-opted, um, you know, by, by quite a few people. And, and to me, yoga is very, very, very much about, you know, improving your relationship and your love and your understanding of the temple that is your body, mm -hmm. Right. And I think it's just beautiful how you talked about um, about it. And so could you sort of um, elaborate on that a little bit for, for, for the sake of our audience? Yeah. You know, yeah, there is the whole yoga is just another workout thing. And that's definitely mm -hmm. not the yoga I teach. And, um, you know, the program I did was, you know, it was a very spiritual one. And so it was very tapped into, you know, our body is uh, a vessel to connect with our deeper, higher selves. And, and it's with that, that I really approach my teaching. And because I have chronic illnesses, the pace of my classes are less about breaking a sweat and more about opening spaces in our bodies or um, cleansing spaces in our body. Mm -hmm. And, and that really that internal wisdom we have and, you know, there's a huge, big movement right now. People are becoming more aware of the wisdom of the body and that it holds emotions and energy for us that our brains can't quite grasp onto sometimes. And really understanding that as, as, as a teacher and moving to those spaces and um, not, you know, understanding too that even when we have what we call a weakness in our body, it's really just an energetic space that's been damaged, um, mm -hmm. you know, passed down in a lineage or inherited or done in our current, like happened to mm -hmm. us in the current life. And 
using yoga to then support that space. So a lot of people are like, I want to go to yoga and have a stronger core. And it's like, well, you know, really that's just an energetic issue that's going on. You know, your core is your power. And so it's like, let's dig into what happens with that power and where is the space mm-hmm. in that as we're trying to build it, you're going to come against roadblock against roadblock until you deal with that energetic energy first. Um, and so it's like, we, you know, we can't paint makeup on top of everything and just expect the monsters behind it to not have a voice too. It's like, we have to give yeah. space for those things as well and, and navigate through those. And that's where, you know, the gift of my current program, it really comes into play with both and working one-on-one with me as we get a dive in, mm. good dive into both. Hell yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so I guess, um, for this next part, could you sort of um, talk to us a little bit about how, you know, as you're, you know, sort of getting a better foothold in your healing journey and you're in sort of the yoga teacher training and you talked earlier about how, you know, the purpose um, became bigger than just you and about serving others. Talk to us a little bit about how your healing journey spurred your desire to help others in a professional way, right? Like this is your, this is your business that you're trying to build. Talk to us about, you know, how that um, happened. Yeah, I feel like, you know, and in kind of in my story then, you know, came, came back around to, you know, I kept doing yoga. Um, I found a way to reopen my photography business with other photographers. Um, But I kept just coming back to still wanting to work with the body and still wanting to Mm -hmm. bring people back into joy. You know, I had gone through depths of depression being so sick and, Mm -hmm. and had started to find a little bit of joy again. And I feel like one of my therapists put this just perfectly. I'll just never forget. She was like, mm. I had locked the closet clothes of grief. Like I was like, I'm not going to deal with this grief. And then it's like the moment I opened the door, playfulness fell out. And this part of me that is a very playful person had gotten shoved away uh, by the mm. amount of grief I was going through. And, and so that's been a, big passion of mine is to tap back into the playfulness. And it wasn't really I, until I started, started to enter into um, the kindred meditation world and then um, doing the facilitator training for that too, that I discovered that that playfulness was still there. It wasn't until I really started to heal a lot more of my brain actually and the trauma I had been through with this meditation in another more yogic like, based meditation called yoga nidra Mm -hmm. um did i shift my brain out of that like survival mode into and regulate my whole nervous system too um and know how to regulate my whole nervous system most people don't even know how to do that um with these meditations did i did i realize that playfulness is a really big part of my life and that is something that a gift I have personally that I felt like I wanted to share with the world. Like ever since I was little, always that person that would make a very weird game out of walking down the street and trying to Mm. see how many people I can make smile. Um, Mm. (laughs) Just because I was like, I thought it was such a fun game of just like, how many people can you make happy? And, you know, as a little kid, it was super innocent and not manipulative at all. It was just very like, this is a fun game of just like, who can we spark? And it's with that, that I just want to do that with other people. It's like, we have this ability to spark each other as humans. And I think that's where the gift of, you know, like what I'm doing, what other coaches doing, what meditation teachers do is like, we're sparking each other um, to light up and have a better, better life. Uh, And so that's where I get really passionate about what I'm doing is, you know, it's really helping people tap back into this playfulness again that really gets kind of like squished out by adulthood and responsibilities. You like you forget how to play and 
to live in joy in every single moment, like from doing the dishes to, um, you know, folding laundry, it's like joy and playfulness can be accessed at any point if we just give ourselves permission to do it. And that's something that I always tell my daughter is like, you're bored and you don't want to do this, find a way to make it fun. And (laughs) so she'll always do that. She'll just find a way to make it fun. And sometimes, you know, where she'll be like transitioning to go do something I asked her to do. And then she takes a detour to like (laughs) lay on the hammock we have or like make a slide for herself. And I'm just like, Olive, please go. My daughter's name is Olive. And I'm like, please go do what you need to. And she's like, I'm making this fun, mom. Like you told me to do. And I'm like, oh, hold it. So she calls me out on my own (laughs) own mission to make life fun. Yes. Okay. You're right. (laughs) Please go have fun as you go brush your teeth. (laughs) Wow. 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 (laughs) (laughs) That is, that is, that is just amazing. Um, You know, I, I feel like this is, this is such a high point. Um, to sort of uh, culminate um, today's conversation, I um, I want to I want to thank you, thank you so much for for your presence and you know being so honest and raw. Um, you know, it's, a lot of you don't know this, but Lumali is actually a writer as well and a very very powerful writer at that. Um, you know, and, and I think today's conversation, uh, I feel very fortunate to, to witness, you know, um, your power. I, I, I tell people this, you know, whenever we think about, you know, the superheroes that, that Marvel and, you know, all these other companies, uh, you know, wrote about all these superheroes, as far as I know, emerged from darkness. Mm -hmm. So I believe darkness is the fuel for you know um for power um and you my friend are are a very powerful being uh who's mm-hmm. full of light and i wish you nothing but good fortune to spread your light to as many people uh in this world to uplift them through their struggles um and to remind them about the power of joy and wonder to transcend their suffering. Mm -hmm. Um, And with that, as we wrap today's conversation up, um, if, you know, the audience members wanted to get in touch with you, what would be, you know, your preferred outlet um, that you would like them to reach out to you for? Yeah, over on Instagram is a great place to connect with me at Curious Joy Project. It's my handle. Um, yeah, that's a great place to connect. I have a lot of my writing on there, but on there, access to sharing some, diving into some meditations with me as like a as first point to come experience uh, what it's like to work with me as, as well, we do kindred meditation over Zoom calls. And so it's accessible for anyone anywhere in the world and I have host a few classes a week and and share that on there on that platform as well awesome and you heard that right anywhere in the world <laughs> yes. um and that's <laughs> and that's at curious joy project I'm also gonna sort of put the handle in the description um once it gets posted but um Thank you so much, Lumalia. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your presence and, you know, that the audience uh, does uh, for how you showed up here. Yeah. Thank you for, for being a beautiful host. <laughs> it's been a joy to be here. Cheers. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. And thank you so much, everybody, for making the time to join us. Love and light.